I'm going to start now. Now here's a patient who in December of 2008 had a bleed in the cerebellum, the middle cerebellar peduncle next to the fourth ventricle, as we can see over here. And uh, four months later, we can see that there's been a resolution of some of the bleed with just a small residual with less deformity of the fourth ventricle. However, in July, it, the patient rebled, likely from a cavernoma. We see now a larger hematoma deforming the fourth ventricle. Here's a follow-up a few weeks later, even further expansion of the hematoma uh, in the brain stem and involving the pons as well. And this is now uh, months later, or a year later, and we can see a large amount of hemosiderin and the residual of the hematoma. Here's another image. What am I pointing to? I like to get a response from the fellows who are with and is watching that. What structure am I pointing at? Very good. Stefan answered that I'm pointing to the olive in the medulla. And we can see here, here's a histological anatomic picture of the olive. The olive sits posterolateral to the pyramid, the cortical spinal tracts. And in this picture of Netter, you can see on the surface, it looks like an olive. I guess to the ancient anatomists, and that's where the name came from. So here, if we look at the sequence of what happened here, we can see that uh, the end result was these changes in the, in the olive. And what is this condition called? Anybody please respond? Correct. Nate, Nate uh, called it correctly. This is hypertroph hypertrophic olivary degeneration. Now, hypertrophic olivary degeneration is an inferior olivary nucleus degeneration secondary to lesions in the dental rubber olivary pathway. These lesions result in a unique form of transsynaptic degeneration, resulting in enlargement. Which, result, which is the result of increased number of astrocyte, neuronal hypertrophy, and eventually uh, there will be uh, atrophy. This is very unusual uh, because of the enlargement. Symptoms are usually palatal myoclonus, tremor, and cerebellar symptoms. Etiology most commonly is hemorrhages. It can also occur with ischemia, hypertension, trauma, surgery and post gamma knife treatment. It's definitely not MS, it does not involve the cortical spinal tract, and it's not a tumor. So in the previous talks I talked about the cortical spinal tract, the cort cortical bulbar tracts briefly, the superior medial and inferior cerebellar peduncles, and the cortical pontal cerebellar tract. I'm going to start today with the dental rubo olivary pathway. Now, as these detailed diagrams show, the dentro olivary pathway is composed of two tracts, the dentro-rubral tract and the rubro olivary tract. If we look at this diagram here, we can see this is the region of the dentate. It communicates with the opposite-sided red nucleus through the superior cerebellar peduncle at a via the dentro rubral tract. So that, that tract goes between the dentate and the opposite sided red nucleus. Then we have another tract, the rubro olivary tract, that communicates the red nucleus with the inferior olive on the same side, and that goes to the rubro olivary tract that I outlined here with the arrows. So these are the two major tracts. 
And this communication is via the inferior and superior cerebellar peduncles. Now, this is a simplified picture of the, these, this, these tracks, it's, and it's named the myoclonic triangle or the triangle of Guyane and Mollaret, French neurologists who described this before. So here again, we see this is the dentate and then the crossing to the other side of the red nucleus and then the inferior olive. So this is the myoclonic triangle. So if we now look at this case I showed before, so this, this is the region of the dentate, uh, and here we see the red nucleus may be a little less uh, dark than its companion, and then we see the changes in the olive. So th these are the structures involving, involved by the component, by the tri in the triangle. Here's another case. This case was read out uh, as showing a tumor involving the olive because of the enlargement of the olive, as you can see in these images. Uh, but again, this was not a tumor, but this was just another example of hypertrophic olivary degeneration, which in this case was the result of surgery and the brain stem involving mainly the pons. This patient had multiple bleeds and there was evacuation of the hematoma and uh, the end result was this hypertrophic olivary degeneration. So again, we have the triangle or myoclonic triangle involving near the region of the dentate or the fibers leading from the dentate. The, the red nucleus does not really show any change, at least by current MR techniques, and we see the changes in the olive. Again, notice the opposite side. This is on the left side, and the red nucleus and the olive on the right side. Another good case there was a marked stroke involving the right cerebellum with marked atrophy. Uh, notice the small middle cerebellar peduncle. And again, on the opposite side, we see the red nucleus, maybe slightly uh, less dark than the opposite side. And again, chronic changes involving the left olive. Again, the triangle. This was an interesting case that uh, Stefan and I looked at, I don't remember if we read it or we just looked at it, the patient was, was examined because of severe vertigo. When we saw hypertrophy and abnormal changes involving both uh, olivary nuclei, uh, as you can see on the, initially on the study and then on the follow-up there's reduced changes, uh, although still abnormal on the flare, and it was not clear why the patient had that, because we could not find nothing else. The region of the dentate looked okay, the red nucleus uh, looked okay, but whatever it is, the, this abnormality of the olives was quite prominent. And also in the literature, here's another case where both olives are involved. However, this patient had a large prior a uh, pontine hemorrhage, explaining why both of these sides were involved. And here's one of the best case that I have, which was given to me two weeks ago by our chief fellow, Nate. And this just a reminder, please, any fellows who see any cases that I may be able to use in my talks, I would greatly appreciate receiving the information. So this patient, uh, was came in in April of this year with a hematoma, notice right in the position of the dentate in the left cerebellum. So here's the normal dentate, here's the left uh, dental involvement. So this was in April. Follow-up examination uh, 
four months later, approximately, notice there's been a retraction. We have a little bit of hemosiridin left in the region of the dentate, but now we have uh, changes in the olive. So another beautiful example of hypertrophic olivary degeneration. As you can see, the dentate is abnormal oh, in the, in the flare and the T2 images. So again, this case shows the typical findings of the myotronic triangle, involvement of the dentate. Maybe the red nucleus shows a little more signal than the opposite side and the olivary ch changes. Okay, so we've covered the dentorubal olivary pathway. Now let's move on to these four uh, important structures. The fasciculus gracilis, cuneatus, the spinothalamic tract, and the medial lemniscus. Just to review again, that the tracts have different names, one of which is lemniscus, is also a tract. However, lemniscus is a sensory tract, and we're going to be talking today about the medial lemniscus. The lateral is for hearing, and the trigeminal uh, I'll talk to you next time. Okay, the sensory tracts. The, so there's proprioception and touch, that is discriminatory touch, are, are mediated by the fasciculus gracilis, also known as gall, fasciculus cuneatus, burdac, and the medial lemniscus. Pain, temperature, uh, touch, and itch are transmitted via the spinothalamic tract. The ventral spinothalamic tract is for crude pressure and touch, and the lateral is pain, temperature, and itch. Now, this very nice diagram shows us the course, and I'll go in detail at the various components here. So here, the sensation gets into the gray matter and the cord, uh, and then the f they, the, they travel along the dorsal columns and enter the, at, the, at the medulla. I mean, they, they travel along the dorsal column and in, at, in the medulla, at the, nucle at the, nu at the fasciculus, uh, the nucleus of the fasciculus gracilis and cuneatus, the fibers then cross over and then travel in the medial lemniscus together with the same side as spinothalamic tract fibers. Eventually, they merge together to form the medial lemniscus. Both of them are called the medial lemniscus that ends in the ventral posterolateral nucleus of the thalamus. I'll go into that later on. So this is just a rough picture of the course of the fibers. This is just diagrammatic, again, showing that the fasciculus cuneatus and gracilis, they merge together with the lateral uh, spinothalamic tract uh, and end up in the medial lemniscus that ends up in the, in the thalamus. Now, if we look at this diagram, we can see the fasciculus cuneatus, posterior aspect of the cord, and more medially fasciculus gracilis. They end up in these tubercles, the cuneate tubercle and the gracile tubercle in the medulla. We can actually see them histologically also here. Now, why is this important for us? because I don't know if you've noticed before, there's a little bump here on the sagittal MR midline sagittal image. You can see it here on the T2 and on the flare. And here it is in an atomic specimen. It's called the clava. The clava is formed by these two tubercles, the gracile and the cuneate tubercles. So that's what we're seeing. So when you see this little bump, it's a normal structure. Now, this uh, specimen shows beautifully uh, the anatomy here. 
These are inferior cerebellar peduncles. These are the pyramid for the cortical spinal tract. And this rectangular structure, that's the medial lemniscus where the fibers continue after they enter, enter from the spine into the medulla. So this is the medial lemniscus, this elongated structure. Here it is on a histologic uh, specimen, and here it is diagrammatically. And the, the spinothalamic tracts are a little bit uh, lateral. They have not joined together with the medial lemniscus yet. See, they're kind of separated still here. So now if we look, uh, and again in the specimen, these would be the fibers of the cortical spinal tract. That's the medial lemniscus for the proprioception fibers. And here it is on a histologic. And diagrammatically, again, medial lemniscus, and next to it, the spinothalamic tract. So why bother with all this anatomy? Because we can see these things on MR. Here we are. Uh, this is a diffusion image and a flare. Notice on the diffusion, this is the cortical spinal tract, and these are the medial lemnisci showing up as these round dots. And even on the flare, we can see this is the region of the cortical spinal tract, and this is the region of the medial uh, lemnisci where the, f where the proprioception fibers run and right next to it is also the spinal telemic fibers. And of course, we can see that now on these uh, DTI images. Remember, before last time I pointed out the cortical spinal tract anteriorly in blue because of the superior inferior direction. In red were the crossing cortical pontocerebellar fibers the middle cerebellar peduncle because of the anterior posteriors in green. And then we have, you might have talked about last time, the superior cerebellar peduncle and the inferior cerebellar peduncle. And now the last missing item, these are the medial lemnisci for the proprioception and, and the various other sensory fibers. So everything here on the DTI can be identified. This was an image from the literature this image I found in our files, not as good, but still shows the various details. So again, everything looks the same like on this anatomic specimen. Now, unfortunately, the medial lemniscus kind of changes direction and kind of gets thinned out and contours, so it looks differently at different levels. Here, at the upper ponds, it has somewhat of a arc shape, as you can see here. You can see here on this image, it has a little bit of an arc shape. Higher up, at the level of the decussation of the superior cerebellar peduncle, it has somewhat of, again, of an arc right lateral to the decussation of the superior cerebellar peduncle. Here it is on an image. It would be hard to identify, but I just want to point out that this is what we should be looking for if you were looking uh, for a position. And you can see on the diagram, that's it. And right, right it's already combined together with a spinothalamic tract. So both of them are together on either side of the decussation of the superior cerebral peduncle. And again, higher up, it's, it's lateral to, posterior lateral to the red nuclei. Here are the red nuclei. This is the, the medial lem lemniscus with the spinothalamic tract. And also on the sagittal planes, we can see the structure. Here it is. This curved structure is the medial lemniscus on the specimen. Here it is on MR. Uh, here we can see it on a sagittal diffusion image, and here it is histologic uh, section. So we can identify all these on MR. Here again it is. Here it shows both 
anteriorly the corticospinal tract and posteriorly the medial lemniscus. As the specimen here, corticospinal tract, medium lemniscus, nicely shown here on, again on the anatomic specimen, both of them, and of course on sagittal uh, tractography, here it is, the corticospinal tract and the medial lemniscus, motor and sensory. That's why I colored it different colors with the arrows. This is tractography from the literature, cortical spinal tract, and medial lemniscus. Okay, why bother with all this? What, what, what am I showing on this image? Let me go to the next one. What, is the, what are the arrows pointing to? Very good. We have two answer. Dan and Stefan both called it correctly. This is the gracile, uh, the the gracile uh, fasciculus. Abnormal. So let's go through the anatomy again a little bit. This is this is the way the the textbook showed it. I reversed it because that's the way we look at. So in dark blue is the the gracile, and more laterally is the cuneatus. Notice that this is anatomically arranged. The cuneate has the cervical region fibers within it. The gracile has the thoracic, lumbar, and sacral fibers in it. So again, if we now look at it the way we look at it, so this would be the gracile more medially and the cuneate more laterally. And then in addition, the lateral spinothalamic pain for touch, pain, itch, those are also notice here are arranged and an important arrangement, again, sacral, lumbar, thoracic, and cervical. So everything is arranged uh, according to where the fibers are coming from. So back to this case, we can see an uh, abnormal signal within both uh, gracile fascicles. What is the possible cause? May I get an answer on the chat? A common cause for this abnormality? No, not MS. Any other answers? Correct. Which gave the correct answer? This is uh, subacute combined degeneration of the spinal cord. This is a vitamin B12 deficiency which produces selective degeneration of dorsal and plus minus lateral spinal cord columns. Pathology is related to a methylmalonic acid accumulation which causes toxicity to the myelin and ends up in megaloblastic anemia. Etiology most common is malabsorption, uh, pernicious anemia, inadequate B2, B12 intake, nitrous oxide toxicity, which also includes recreational nitrous oxide toxicity, HIV, copper deficiency. The symptoms are loss of position, vibration sense, paresthesia, stiffness, numbness, tingling, hyperreflex of Pazibabinsky, and mental status decline. So here's another case. It came 
for us to be studied, questioned, herniated disc. Patient had whole body numbness, back pain, and ataxia. And again, we see, not as nice as in the last case, but we can see the abnormal signal in the region of the posterior columns uh, involving, again, the gracile uh, fasciculi. So again, to show here, you remember here the two gracile and the cuneators are more laterally. As you can see in this other diagram in red, the gracile and the cuneate. Okay, what are we seeing in this case? Anybody? Correct. Stefan answered, that's, we're seeing abnormality involving the cuneate. Remember, notice the more, the more away from the away from the midline. So here again, we're pointing now, the arrows are pointing to the, the, the cuneate on this side and on the opposite side, so this is the two involved in the two cuneates. This patient came with spinal stenosis, noticed the abnormal signal in the cord, again, abnormality involving both cuneate, posterior column cuneate. Now one of the issues, it may be hard sometimes to tell what's involved. Here we see involvement of the gray, uh, central gray of the cord, and notice, like in this case, uh, it's not clear. Is it just involving the central gray, the posterior horns, or is it also involve the cuneates? And sometimes you have to say maybe both are involved, but it's not always clear. Uh, this was post-surgical decompression. Was it just the posterior part of the central gray or also the cuneate? Okay, what's another condition that I have not mentioned so far? Although, uh, Asif raised the possibility. Correct. Both Asif and Stefan came up with a correct diagnosis. This is a finding usually seen in syphilitic myelopathy or tabus dorsalis. And again, if we all know, patients affected with that have severe problems with their posterior columns. Now here's a very interesting case, hot off the press, done 11 days ago, given to me by uh, Frank Minja. This was a very interesting patient that 40-year-old woman had progressive spasticity, neuropathy, and bladder problems, and they also had a strong family history of hereditary spastic paraplegia. Now, uh, when they, this was done two ways. The T2 really did, in the cervical region, did not show a lot of abnormality, but the patient also had T2 medic, which is a heavily T2 starred spoiled granin sequence. And there in the cervical region, there was this central region of high signal, uh, again, in the region of the gracile fasciculi. The problem was that there was a, this, this sequence has a lot of uh, stuff that shows up. For instance, in the medulla, you see the, 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 the olives, and there's a lot of signal. So I was a little concerned, is this an artifact or is this real? But assuming how bright it is, uh, but why not on the regular T2? because two months earlier, the patient had just a thoracic and lumbar study, and it had all this abnormality in the cord on the T2. So uh, if, when I was talking to Frank about it, he said that the, the, the 
abnormal changes may appear earlier on the T2 medic, but we'll have to see if that's really the case. But I was a little concerned because of all this signal that maybe this was partly artifactual. But the interesting thing that uh, the, this condition, hereditary spastic paraplegia, uh, usually it, it's involves axonal degeneration in the longest descending and ascending tract. So it involves the corticospinal tract and even mentions specifically the fasciculus gracilis. So this may be a true finding here because it's just appropriate with this condition. Okay, here's a patient has lung CA with severe pain. Can we make anything of the findings here? We can, because this abnormal signal is in the, spinothal the lateral and ventral spinothalamic tract which mediate pain from the body. Uh, just as I point out here in the diagram. So we can, this is why we have this lateral abnormal signal. Patient at the same time also had involvement of the cuneate, I mean, of the gracile to, uh, to uh, fasciculi as well, although there wasn't any specific symptoms I could find, except for this, which goes along with a lateral spinothalamic tracts. Here's a patient who had lower extremity numbness and motor weakness. Numbness because of involvement of the fasciculi here. This is the region of the lateral corticospinal tract, so explaining the motor weakness and the numbness in the posterior, posterior columns. Another case, a patient with GBM had C2 and C4 drop metastases and severe balance problems. Uh, this is just some involvement of the central gray, but notice involvement here of either the fasciculus gracilis or cuneatus. Uh, but that explains why the patient has severe balance symptoms. So we can, by looking and knowing what structures are there, we can at least show some clinical uh, acuity. Here's a patient that RJ and I looked for quite a while. This was unfortunately a 10-year-old with questionable Wilson disease, had liver failure, developed, uh, had the uh, a transplant, and all kind of symptoms afterwards, cerebral edema, basal ganglia lesion, was question of increased copper, and also question of B12 deficiency. But again, we see the abnormal signal in the fasciculus gracilis, and, and possibly also in the, in the cuneate. Here we have a patient cord lesions, typical abnormalities involving the optic nerve, abnormal signal, and the fasciculus, uh, both fasciculus gracilis, and of course, this is a case of MS, which I guess can also involve the posterior columns. This is a patient with a melanoma met, Involving which structure? Please give me an answer. I mentioned the structure earlier in my talk. Correct. Nate pointed out that this is the clava. Remember, the clava is where the tubercle of the fascicular gracilis and cuneate sit. So again, the area of involvement where the posterior columns are. So again, here it is, the clava, the two tubercles, and here it is on a sagittal notice, markedly expanded by the metastatic melanoma. And here it is on the axial. Okay, here we have a stroke.
patient presented with upper, left upper and lower extremity uh, sensory symptoms. And why am I showing this? Because we can see here, the patient had both motor and sensory symptoms. So again, if we look at this diagram, at this, spec at this brain specimen, this is the pyramid cortical spinal tract. This is the medial lemniscus sensory. Cortical spinal tract in red, sensory in blue. So that's why the stroke is involving the cortical spinal tract and the medial lemniscus. That's why the patient has both upper, has lower, upper and lower extremity motor diff and sensory symptoms because the, both the, these important structures are involved by this stroke. And again, as I mentioned before, this kind of rectangular distribution of uh, the various territories in the medulla, notice, so this would be the perforators coming off the vertebral arteries, giving you this kind of uh, rectangular shape to the stroke. Again, if we look here, a different kind of a stroke, you could see the elongated stroke here would involve both the cortical spinal tract and the medial lemniscus. So this patient had right arm weakness and numbness. Again, ex both symptoms explained by the distribution of the stroke. Here's an MS involving the region of the medial lemniscus, as we can see here in all these pictures. Medial lemniscus. This patient had a stroke a long time ago, had left-sided numbness, and again, the lesion is pretty close, not perfect, but in the region of the medial lemniscus. Patient was right upper and lower extremity numbness, nausea, vomiting, and left facial droop. A little small stroke here in the medulla. Why am I showing this? Because of the, what we can see here in the diagram. Again, this, these are the medial lemnisci. This is the nucleus for the facial nerve, which I'll cover when I talk about the nerves. And these columns uh, are really the columns for the 9th, 10th, 11th nerve. If you have any involvement in, in, in this region, you would get the nausea and vomiting here, uh, the facial droop because of the proximity to the facial nucleus, and the uh, and the numbness because of the involvement of the medial lemnisci. So this is kind of important territory involving these three components, explain the three different symptoms. What is this unusual condition? Kind of involving the medial lemniscus, as you can see here. Fortunately, we don't see as, uh, this too much anymore. Anybody? an unusual condition somewhat nowadays, at least because of the treatment. Okay, I'll move on. This was PML, okay? PML, uh, and, and we can see kind of involving the region of the medial lemnisci. See all the changes here in the cerebellum, medial cerebellum peduncle. Here again, so this is the normal medial lemniscus and this is where the involvement is in the PML. And here you can see the medial lemniscus on the various uh, specimens. Okay, now to the last part of the talk. Here we see on the diffusion a tiny stroke. And the report 99% of the time will say patient has a tiny stroke in the uh, left thalamus. 
But when I finally found this case, I became very excited. Patient presented with right arm numbness. Why, was, why did I like this case? Because we now deal with the next stage of the posterior columns. You remember the meat, we have the fasciculus, gracilis, which progresses into the medial lemniscus. The medial lemniscus ends up in the ventral posterior thalamic nucleus. I mean, ventral posterior lateral thalamic nucleus, a difficult name to remember, but unfortunately that's what was given to this region by prior anatomist. Again, if we look at this diagram, so the spinal thalamic tract proceed, they join together with the medial lemniscus, and then they get to the ventral posterior lateral nucleus of the thalamus. This is where the, the sensor fibers end up. And from there, they travel to the cerebral cortex, to the postcentral gyrus. Now, these diagrams from Duvernoy show he identifies, here's the VPL, uh, which is the ventral postal lateral nucleus of the thalamus. Here it is on the coronal plane, and here it is on an axial plane, the VPL. So here we are. I reversed this so it'll match the, the patient. So this patient had right arm numbness. And now we can be much more sophisticated because this tiny dot, this tiny stroke, is right in the location of the vent ventral posterolateral thalamic nucleus, right where the sensory fibers end. Here's another patient, a stroke in the thalamus. But again, because of its position, you can see the patient presented with numbness in the right arm and leg. Remember, the fibers all crossed from right to left. So again, we have a stroke in, involving the ventral postulateral nucleus of the thalamus where the sensory fibers end, just in the perfect position here. So again, we just is just saying that it's just the thalamic stroke, we could be much more sophisticated and point out that that's in the region of the ventral postulateral uh, nucleus. And here, here again, it is on the same patient on the coronal flare, and notice, and just the correct location for the VPL. Another patient, symptoms of numbness in right arm and leg. The left side of the thalamus, we see a lesion, again, in the region of the ventral postolateral nucleus. On the coronal image, again, fits in the perfect location. Another patient presented with right hemi body numbness. A lesion, a little stroke, had multiple other lesions, but we can focus on that because this explains the patient's symptomatology. Again, right in the location of the VPL ventral postural nucleus of the thalamus. And here's a case, doesn't show much on the, on the CT. Patient had lower extremity weakness and sensory loss. So the weakness But then when the patient had an MR, we see a stroke in this location. So by now we know which way I'm leading to. 
Here we have two involvements. Constipation has weakness and also has sensory loss in the right lower extremity. Uh, so the sensory loss is because of the involvement of the VPL, the ventral postulateral nucleus of the thalamus. But remember, the ventral postulateral nucleus is just, just a bit behind the posterior limb of the internal capsule. So here, because of the size of the lesion, both structures are involved, the VPL and the posterior limb of the internal capsule. And so that explains both the symptom, the sensory and the motor symptoms. And sure enough, a follow-up CT showed that although the initial CT you, have, you would read as normal, here we can see the lesion now again in the thalamus and very close to the posterior limb of the internal capsule. And uh, so it explains why both these symptoms uh, occurred because of this location. Okay, so this is the end of this talk today. So, so far we've covered all these tracks and what's left now is the trigeminal lemniscus and the spinal trigeminal nucleus and tract which I'll be talking about next week when I talk about the trigeminal nerve and the last tract the medial longitudinal fasciculus the MLF I will cover when I talk about the the fourth nerve so that is, is all for today thank you for participating bye <laughs>